I think it is. That's, I would rather go that way. Just go. Praise God. I'm going to do it exactly like the Lord told me to do it. Is that all right? He told me to say this three times, and I'm going to say it three times, and then I'm going to go where he wanted me to go. Composure. Say composure. Okay. So composure. Can I coach you a little bit? I mean, if you came back on a Sunday night, you're coachable. Right? All right. So composure exists when our purpose and our priorities are bigger than our pressures and our problems. Composure exists when our purpose and our priorities, y'all know what purpose is? Do you have a purpose? Do you know what priorities are? Seek ye first, right? That's a priority scripture. Are bigger than your pressures and your problems. Composure exists when our purpose and our priorities are bigger than our pressures and our problems. Do you think composure is important? You know, when I was seeking God about, I don't want to preach anything, and I was sensitive. God's got people, and he gave me, you know, what do you call those things where it has the letters? It's not an acronym. It's, um, is it an acronym? Yeah, okay. I get those mixed up, acronym and synonym or whatever, of champion. And I, I never do that. That's not me. If you knew me, I'm not in. T- it's just not me doing the little cute rhyme thing or the, you know, putting the letters. And I'm not saying God can't do that. I just don't do that. And God gave that to me in champion. And man, and you would think the letter C to start off, you would think, man, there's a lot of easy ones, right? Courage, right? I mean, but he gave me composure. And, and, and so composure's crucial. <laughs> I mean crucial to the body of Christ. I think about it in sports. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. But you're going to hear something tonight that this is one of those messages that God said, I need my people to have this now. Now. Right now. Because it's given place to the devil. Now, the Bible says don't give him place. So, if the Bible says don't give him place, then we have the ability to not give him place. But he has to have a place, right? So he's looking for a place. So what gives him that place? Now, how are we to act during this time? I think about, (laughs) I'm going to go on a rabbit trail right now. I think about John, I, I told your pastors this at lunch. I was getting ready for church the other day, and the Lord said, how's it going? Now, some of y'all ain't going to believe that that happened. That happened. I, I knew it was him. It was in my spirit. I kind of laughed. Oh, that's funny. God is asking me how it's going when he's the one who knows how it's going. So I knew my reaction was crucial, my answer. And... And I'm, and I'm just thinking, I'm not talking out loud, I'm just thinking this and that, it's going good, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, hey, we are during this time, this, you know, pandemic and blah, blah, blah. And then I just sense this, how would you think John G. Lake would have reacted if I asked him? He lived during a pandemic, he lived during the bubonic plague. How's it going, John? What would he have said? Do you realize that? Back during the bubonic plague, he said, put it in my hand and put it under a microscope and you'll watch it die. And they did, and it did. Has there been any faith preachers today saying, put COVID, come on, where is it? Testing it? Proving God? And I'm putting me in there. How's it going? So what would John G. Lake have said? And then I remembered, my mom was best friends with his daughter. And and, uh, his book was named 
adventures in God. It was an adventure to him. When something would come up, he would just say, it's just another adventure in God. We should be living an adventure. That's what God created us to live an adventure. Amen? And so, glory to God. I'll get back on track here. Uh, the Lord said, I want you to teach and coach them and train them on how to act. Because a true child of God is easily identified by their behavior. And they're being watched. This ain't just about you. You got to understand this. You're being watched. Not when just everything's going good, but when it's tough. When there's pressure. Right? All right, let's look at Matthew 7, 16 through 20. Let's read that. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they what? By the way they act. How's it going? Well, I don't know. It's kind of tough. Yeah. Can, you, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Click. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. Click. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Click. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Click. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Amen? God's got people. And they're being identified by their actions. All right? Now, glory to God. My teams knew when I was coaching to never, and this was a huge advantage to us, and I think about the body of Christ as a team. It was a huge advantage to us because I told them never, ever, 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 not once argue a call or blame an umpire. Ever. It can be the worst call in the history of sports. And I do not want you to argue it, kick dirt, do anything, anything like that, because that, that will get you into a place where you'll make worse decisions. And it will also show the enemy, are you with me? It will give them a sign of some kind, and it may give them more momentum. Never. You want to hear losers talk, they'll go, oh, we'd have won if it wasn't for that bad call. That happens all the time. There's so many things that could have happened in that game that if you would have played better, that bad call wouldn't have made any difference. And so that was an advantage to our players to know this, to never, ever do it. Because no matter what, you're going to make a foolish decision if you lose control. you got to keep composure. Now, this is all going to get somewhere, trust me. I'm not just preaching on composure. It's, it's getting to a specific thing. That the devil is using. Now, my teams, we played teams that were more talented than us. But when the scouting report came in that they were not disciplined. Ha, huh, that, was, that, was, <laughs> that was music to our ears. Because if we're playing a team that's not disciplined, that means they lose control. And all of a sudden a bad hop happens or a bad play or a bad call happens. Here's a coach here. He knows what I'm talking about. And they lose control. They'll start fighting amongst themselves. They'll start blaming each other. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So we knew that. And I believe that the devil knows the same thing, that if he can get the servants of God and the champions of God and God's people out of control, they're not going to make the right decisions. They're going to lose focus. They're going to lose that focus, their purpose. They're going to lose the priority of everything. And there's a lot of things that we're living in right now. How's it going? <laughs> How's it going, Alma, Arkansas? I mean, we're living in a time where a lot of things are making us mad. There's just a lot of stuff, like I said this morning. Man, I need some good news. Now we're getting ready to go into election. Okay, cricket, cricket. <laughs> Do not use this as a political. Okay. So. Glory to God. So when the scouting report come back that they were non-disciplined, we we, that was an easy win because we knew they were going to lose it. They, they, all of a sudden, they would start feeling like everyone was versus them, right? 
that they can't catch a break, that they get no luck. They're being cheated. They're being ripped off. You guys are just lucky. We love hearing that. And so they would develop what we call a victim mentality. And you guys realize that God did not create the church to have a victim mentality. But a victor's mentality. A victim mentality, and that's what race, all of this, every life matters. They do. And all these things matter. But that spirit will get behind it in that victim mentality. And divide. And so it's, it gives him place. It's not fair. How come it's always me? Right? So no matter, right? So I taught my players, you know, if they say you're lucky, then we always said luck was when hard work meets opportunity. And um, we work hard. You gave us an opportunity by scheduling us. So you're right. We are going to get all the breaks. We are going to get all the bounces. We are. Everything's going to go our way. And if it doesn't, so what? It will next time. Amen. That is a victor's mentality. And that's what God wants us to have. Not the I'm, I, it's not fair mentality. Now, we stayed professional and stayed composure, and I preached it, preached it, preached it, preached it because others are watching. All right? So I would tell them teams are watching you, opponents are watching you, scouts are watching you, little boys who have your baseball card are watching you. Moms of the little boys who want you to be their role model are watching you. They're not just watching you on the field. They're watching you off the field. They're watching your actions. Whoever you are, how young or old you are, they're watching you. When you play football on Tuesdays or Thursday, whatever it is, what day you play, they're watching you. And so they're watching your actions. So I thought about, you know, church. We need to wake up because somebody's watching us. Amen? God, people let your people close to you, you're where you're at because you're supposed to be where you're at for a purpose, and they're watching you. Your family's watching you. Your coworkers are watching you. Your students or whatever it might be. So what are they hearing, and what are they seeing? Do they see an angry, complaining church? Do they see a, or hear Christians crying, fed up, poor me? This isn't fair, Christians. So that's not a very good scouting report. Now, the world doesn't need to see this. So, glory to God. How do we need to act? Let's go. Here we go. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. Let's start there. Woo, this is going to get good now. Here we go. Uh, is, that the, is that the amplified? Is there two types of amplified? You got classic? That's it? When angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your fury, your indignation last until the sun goes down. All right? Very next verse. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give him no opportunity. All right? Be ye angry, right? This is the one in King James. And sin not. For that will give a place to the devil. Well, we don't want to give place to the devil. You guys want to win? Don't give the enemy place. Let's stop that. How do we stop that? What is this talking about? And so I was sharing this with mom, and she said, Chip, have you got the War L New Testament? And I said, no, and it's actually kind of rare nowadays. And the comment the commentary on this verse. Listen to this. It is right to feel a temporary anger at some outrage. And not to feel this way at such conduct would imply indifference to crime and wrong. At things that are wrong. But we must, here it comes. Gosh, God, let, them, let this be revealed. Let them catch this. But we must not nurse anger. Now here it is. Whatever may be the cause, for anger nursed will grow into wrath. 
Are y'all with me? And wrath is where the place for the devil to enter in. There's going to be a lot of things that make us angry. How are we to react? We need to know these things. We're God's people. God said, I've got people. Well, they're not losing composure. And these people that God is using in the last days are not just losing it on any little political thing. They're not losing it on, well, I don't like this mask thing. Well, I don't like this rule. Well, I don't like that. They're not losing it. Are y'all with me? Because they don't let the sun go down. I mean, come on, you don't even want the sun to go down on it. That's how important it is. Because the prince of thieves who comes in like a thief in the night will get in there. Now, so think about that word nurse. Anger nursed will turn into hatred. Hatred is not of God. Be angry and sin not. Yes, you can be angry at some things. But don't allow it to become sin. Stay disciplined. Stay in control. Consider Jesus speaking to the disciples. Remember this in the Bible? The disciples wanted to call down fire from heaven. And they're like, come on, give it to them. This is outrageous. This is ridiculous. It could have even been a a mask rule. I don't know. But Jesus said, what did he say to them? Y'all remember? You know not what spirit you are of right now. These were the ones that were following him the closest, and he says, you don't even know what spirit you're acting in right now. What does that mean? Guard your spirits. You understand what I'm talking about? You need to guard your spirit. Now, church, we can operate. We can serve and seek God. We can send angels after our stuff. We can write our own ticket, and we can have authority and rule and reign all without letting the devil push us into wrath. Amen? Do you agree with that or not? So if the word says give no place to the devil, then we we need to wake up and stop giving him place. Some of us, it's kind of been in us for a long time. There's things that, that sets us off pretty quick. Because it's still there for whatever reason. It can be just some little thing. But you went to bed on this thing a long time. And it gave place to him and he's camped out and he's hooked up. And he's got a holt. That's a holt. Got a holt of you. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm in Arkansas. Amen. Anger is not sin unless it is nursed. So when... Nate and I were doing a meeting with Brother Copeland on the youth rally. I was telling Brother Copeland this in the back room. And he goes, oh, man. He said, you know the name El Shaddai means nurse. He's the nurse. Who's nursing you? Who's feeding you? Where are you getting fed from? What spirit is controlling? Do you even know? Man, I'm going to tell you, this is going to change. It's going to change the momentum of the ball game that you're living in. And and you're going to start seeing more victories. Why? Because you're composed. You're composed. Your purpose and your priorities are bigger (laughs) than your pressures and your problems. But there's a lot of Christians that can't wait to get to church to talk about the pressures and the problems. They can't wait to talk about social media, about all the pressures and the problems. And don't even realize that the enemy is given place. And they're struggling. They're struggling with relationships. They're struggling with finances and health issues. They're struggling with their calling. They're struggling with all kinds of things because of this. But he says, don't give him place. Don't let it turn into wrath. Sure, things are going to be things that you don't like. That's okay. You shouldn't like evil or injustice. But don't let it. Don't nurse it. Are y'all with me? Nursing it. Feeding it, right? You think of nurse? Feeding it. Amen. Glory to God. 
So hatred is of the devil. Whoa! Chip, stop right there. Jesus hated iniquity. Jesus hated unrighteousness and evil. This is scripture. So you're saying he is of the devil. So is Jesus of the devil? Of course not. Well, how do you explain that? Here's the difference. Jesus doesn't let the spirit of hatred get a hold of him. Jesus hates sin, not the sinner. Now, here's the example that I can give of the difference of this, of getting a hold of you. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 Amplified. Let's look at this. Now, also, we would not have you be ignorant, brethren, about those who fall asleep or die. How many's ever had anybody close to them that died or went to heaven or moved on? All right? That you may not grieve for them as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. All right? I don't know. Is that all I wanted or do I want some more? Yeah, that's all I want. So we don't grieve for those as the rest do. We will grieve. Stay with me. The Jews, we go to Israel. We do tours every year. The Jews have a grieving period. You get this many days. Grieve all you want, but after that day, you better stop. Every one of them will stop you in your tracks. <laughs> Get over it. You had your time. I mean, they will. Why? Because if you don't, watch this, it'll get a hold of you, and depression will come, and then maybe anxiety and pressures will come, and then if, if it gets a hold of you, suicide thoughts. Now, that's dangerous. Why? Because you, you let it get a hold of you. But how many of us know that, yeah, you grieve when you lose a lost loved one. That's okay. But we don't grieve as others grieve. We get angry. Are y'all with me? See how I'm tying this in? We get angry, but not like others get angry. Are y'all getting this? I need, I need your heads to do something. Things are going to make us angry, but not like others do. Amen. Okay. All right. Hopefully, I'm just trying to paint this out for you. Now, uh, guard your heart above everything else. The Bible says that. Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. Let's look at that. Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Click. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Stay away from it. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe, the safe path. And don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Guard your hearts. I'm telling you, the Lord, I have heard this more since this time of negative and since this time of social media and since this time of what's happening and who's behind it and they're blooding in it and they're doing it all because of this and they're trying to get him and I'm telling you I mean I have seen an anger come out of Christians like never before and then on the flip side I have seen and heard this as I travel that the Lord's going God visited me in the night God came in my bedroom God I mean every, like Get off social media. Your faith ain't there. Well, brother Chip, we need to know what's going on, and I need to know what to pray for. That's fine if your faith is strong. Amen. Your faith is strong, and you feed your spirit, man, and your faith more than you do your, your soul and your body, because that's what's going to dominate. Mom's taught me that all my life. Chip, spirit, soul, and body. I'm going to test you right now. How many can see me? Raise your hand. <laughs> Finally. Mom has this trick. It's a trick question. If you know the Bible and what it says, we are a spirit. I am a spirit that has a soul. That's your mind, will, and emotion. That lives in a body. It's a temple. It's this body. It's a house. We can do all kinds of things to this house. We can add on. Lose roofs, paint roofs, paint. There's all kinds of things. Go ahead. 
still going to heaven. Amen? It's your body, right? But the real me is looking through double windows here. My eyes, and then I've got some wind, you know, some winter, uh, you know, just guarded over. So, <laughs> I didn't even know the right word for it. What, what's it called when you put something over your windows in the winter? You, I don't know, y'all, you know, it doesn't matter. Put plastic over it or something. Y'all don't do that, okay. So y'all don't know. So if I were to go to heaven right now, this, what, would be right there, wouldn't it? But you just raised your hand and said you can see me. But where would I be? You can say heaven a little bit faster than that. Where would I be? I don't know. <laughs> I would be chest bumping Jesus. You guys know that? We're family. I told you that. So you wouldn't see the real me. You ever been to the funeral home and saw your dad or your mom or your brother and go, oh, that ain't them. That ain't them. That's the place where you can preach spirit, soul, and body. Right there. I remember seeing my dad. That ain't him. My dad was full of life and fun. That ain't him. That's his body. Are y'all with me? Of the three, this is how easy this is. If anybody's dealing with any kind of addiction, this is your answer. Whichever of those three you feed the most, you nurse the most, is going to dominate the other two. And if you're not dominating the other two, your will and your mind and emotions and your body, then social media is going to dry your faith up, man. Can I just tell it like it is? It's going to. I catch it doing it to me. I'll hear something. Nah! You know, I don't want to hear that. But then you can get to a place where we, we, we can check on different things and what to pray for and know what to do. But you gotta, you got to build that spirit man up first. Amen. Or you'll easily get into wrath. Well, I'm not anger. It's not wrath. I'm just angry. Well, angry all the time is wrath. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Guard your heart, amen? And, and so many people have been told by God to get off there now until you're ready and, and able to do it. Now, I don't mean we can't use it because it, it can be a good tool for the body of Christ. But you've you got to watch it and guard your spirit. Stay in a place where God can use you. The devil wants you to lose it. He wants you to lose control. He wants you to lose peace. He wants you to lose your, your position. And the Bible says don't even go to bed with it, man. Clean it all up, right? So don't let it stick and take hold. Now, let's go to Isaiah 54. This is not going to be a very long teaching tonight, but it's going to be straight to the point. Is that okay? Because you guys don't usually come on Sunday, but it'll be good. It'll be what God wanted. And all your spiritual children shall be dis disciples taught by the Lord and obedient to his will. And great shall the peace and what? Undisturbed composure. Whoo! Of your children. Click. You shall establish yourself in righteousness. Establish yourself in righteousness. Rightness in conformity with God's will and order. You shall be far from even the thought of oppression or destruction. For you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not even come near you. Who? The undisturbed composure. Click. Behold, they may gather together and stir up strife, huh? but it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife against you shall fall and surrender to you. 
Behold, I have created the smith who blows up the fire of coals and who produces a weapon for its purpose, and I have created the devastator to destroy. Now, is that verse 16? Okay, yeah, one more. But no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. How many has ever quoted that? No weapons formed against you shall prosper. So that means weapons are going to form. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall show to be in the wrong. This peace, righteous security, triumph over opposition is the heritage. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is for the servants. Moses, what did he say to Joshua? Moses, my servant, is dead. God called David his servant. We are servants of the Lord. Amen? And these, these is what's for the heritage of the servants of the Lord. What? That no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Glory to God. If there was ever a time for God needs servants who are undisturbed composure, it is now. Right now. He had one in John G. Lake. He had Smith Wigglesworth and some others, but he needs more now. Amen. Glory to God. And so what is composure? It's defined as a serene, self-controlled state of mind or a calmness. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Jesus on the boat during the storm. And they couldn't get over it. It reminds me of Paul and Silas in prison singing. They're singing and rejoicing in prison. But what do you hear a lot of Christians? Griping, complaining, poor us, this ain't right, what's going on? Man, as much as I love you, the devil's got in place. He's got in place. The Bible says don't give him place. Things are going to make you angry. As long as you live here, the devil is the God of this world, and there's going to be things that make you angry. Don't nurse it. Stop it. The Holy Spirit will tell you immediately. I don't like that. That's okay. Amen? Don't continue on there and don't go to bed at night like that. Get it right with him. Get it right with them, whoever it is. But get it right with him. God, don't let that. Remember when David said, don't let that get in my heart. He said something about there's a scripture. May go to my lips, but not in the air. There's a head thing and there's a heart thing. Amen. Don't let it get to my heart. This is reminding me of something. I remember one time I was preaching on how God hates murmuring. It's in the Bible. Hates it. Do you all understand hate? He hates it. Well, Mom, what's the difference? Are we just supposed to live in a closet and never, our head in the sand? And never, and I said, what's the difference between murmuring and facts that are out there? But Chip, you we got to know these certain things. She said, that's easy. I said, well, I need to know. Because <clears throat> I felt myself murmuring. And I knew God hated it. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying, get out of this, man. You're giving place. She said, let me give you a few examples. If you ever went to a restaurant and your wife said, it's cold in here. If you ever went to a church, it's cold in here. Or wherever, a movie theater, whatever. It's cold in here. That's a fact. Have you ever read the paper or seen the news? Uh, Gas prices have went up. That's a fact. She said, "That's that's the head part. It hadn't got into your heart yet. But if you said, you know what? It's always cold in here, and it's ridiculous how cold it is in here. As a matter of fact, It shouldn't be. Now it's getting into your heart. Now it's becoming a heart issue rather than just the fact. And then I've heard some people after I preach that, well, that's just the fact. Well, if you're just (laughs) using that all the time, then it's murmuring. You know what I'm talking about. Continual continual facts turn into murmuring. But I think about Paul snake bit and the composure that he had. And then I remembered some things in baseball. Do you all remember when baseball executive Branch Rickey, this is a long time ago, and maybe you've seen the movie 42. 
But there was a baseball executive named Branch Rickey, and he was looking for the first African-American baseball player in the major league. And he knew that he had to find somebody special. He knew that it would cause a lot of trouble getting the first black man into baseball. And he also knew, knew that having the first um, uh, African-American baseball player, that this player was not only going to have to be great, but he was going to have to possess a, a mental toughness and a discipline like nobody else. And so there were many that could have come before Jackie, but that, that, that couldn't handle it, couldn't stay composed, couldn't do it. It's gonna, he's going to have his life threatened all the time, every day, everywhere he goes. And so Branch Rick, Ricky selects who? Jackie Robinson. And he, he tells Jackie this. I'm looking for a ball player with enough guts to not fight back. That's what I'm looking for. With enough guts to not fight back. You got to keep your purpose and your priorities bigger than your pressures and your problems. That's called composure. Amen? Winston Churchill said, you will never reach your destination." If you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks along the way. <laughs> Come on now. You're throwing stones at every dog that barks. You're never going to get where you're going. Evidently, there was a lot of dogs back then. Part of, <laughs> part of keeping your composure is knowing when to keep your mouth closed. Amen. Every thought that comes to your mind isn't always the best one spoken. Growing in composure, right, is also goes right along with growing in the fruits of the Spirit. And, and it also means when we submit our will and temperament to the Holy Spirit. You have to do that. Composure exists when? When your priorities and your purpose is bigger than your pressures and your problems. Is composure important. Man, we've watched it. I remember one time we were playing a uh, playoff game, and, and the scouting report was they had more talent than we did, but they were not disciplined. They would lose it. All you had to do was get up on them early, do something, make a play, get loud, and, 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 and do something to where they'll turn against themselves. And they had a pitcher who was dominating, dominating. So we did a lot of little stuff like bump, bump, bump. I mean like four or five in a row. We're just making things happen. We're hitting run, this, that, bump, run, blah, blah, blah. And finally, we scratched about the third inning. And this guy usually just threw, throws no hitters or shutouts, and he was dominating. And this happened. I, I don't, I, I really never even told this story. And uh, maybe once or twice. And because uh, it's a very embarrassing story for that young man. Because he made a lot of foolish decisions. But that's what happens. You'll make foolish decisions. And the enemy gets in. And so he gets frustrated, and the coach comes out to the mound, and they get into it, and there it is. We're watching it. And my players even see. I'm, I preach it at them, and they're watching this loose composure. And they're getting into a fight, and they get into a fight on the mound, and the coach kicks him off the team right there. And he throws his glove and the whole bit and starts to walk off the field. And the coach yells, no, that means that uniform's mine. Take it off. And so in front of everybody, he makes him take the uniform off. And so he's down to his sliding shorts and an Under Armour shirt or something underneath. And he goes, well, why don't you take these too? It got really, really bad. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, this is terrible. One foolish decision after another. Why? Because they lost it. And that's what happens when you nurse it. You may not think it's a big deal. You want to get on your soapbox and stand up for what you believe. There's nothing wrong with standing up for what you believe. Don't nurse it. Stop it. Come on, I'm coaching you. Some of you don't like to hear this. This is what coaches do. Stop that. If we're going to win, we're going to win. This is what we have to do. Champions have got to keep it together. Oh, come on now. Paul kept it together. Amen. 
I'm thankful Paul kept it together, aren't you? Woo, look at the results of the things that he did. Glory to God. So, last but not least, think about our greatest ex example of who kept it together, but Jesus. Think about that. In the face of lies and vicious attacks and even crucifixion, he kept his composure the whole time because of the purpose and the priority was bigger than the pressures. He had pressures like we don't even know. But we're living in a time of pressure right now. But he wasn't moved by it. Aren't you glad he wasn't moved by it? I'm so glad he wasn't moved by the persecution. I'm so glad he wasn't moved by the pressure. I'm so glad he wasn't moved by the pain. What if he was moved by the pain? His life was consumed with purpose. Is yours? With purpose. What's the purpose? What's the priority? I remember when God said to me, Chip, are you seeking me? I said, yeah. I gotta, I, can I give you all a hint? If God ever asks you something, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. I learned this. I kept trying to answer him so he could, I knew he was busy. He's got to be God. He's got a busy job. Maybe he needs to, you know, feed some people over in Africa or something. And, and he, you know, yeah, Lord, I said, yes, I'm seeking you. And I gave him a list. Everybody say a list. And I said, I'm, I go to church. I read my Bible. I pay my time. I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. I gave him this list. So we got that clear. So I continued on and I heard it again. Are you seeking me stronger? Lord, yes. So I went to my wife, Candy. I'm Chip, she's Candy. Some of you know what's coming next. We're like God's little concession stand. I can't help it. It's in there. I got I to gotta do it. My daughter, Cookie, <laughs> and then my son, Nacho. But no, no, <clears throat> that's not important. Those kids aren't important right now. No, my son and daughter are not named that, but we are Chip and Candy. So I go to Candy, and I said, Candy, because I didn't want to tell her God was saying this to me because I didn't want to get into a real long spiritual conversation. I was watching a football game. I'm just being honest. Is that okay to be real? And I said, are you, would you say we seek God? And she said, yeah. And guess what she gave me? A list. Now, y'all are looking real holy. Every one of you, I wouldn't give the list. <laughs> but if I hadn't asked you that, and, and, and God got everybody in a soundproof room one by one and asked everybody that, you probably would have said something like that. Are you seeking me? Yeah. He wasn't after the list. The list follows. What he was after was my heart. He was after the real me. What was my priority and what was my purpose? I was doing the things of a Christian man, but was I focused? Was I composed? And then I heard it a third time. Are you seeking me? And I said, evidently not. So I called mom. I did what any great man of God would do. <laughs> Give me a little credit here. I called mom. Mom, what's seek me? Well, I, Hebrew, right? So she has her doctorate in Hebrew. She said, well, I know this and that, but let me call and get some more study on it. I'll get back with you. She calls up Rick Renner. And so here's a Greek scholar and a Hebrew scholar. And they find this thing that is in both the Hebrew and Greek, the root word that means the same. That word. So when the Greek translated it from the Hebrew, it means the same. But you have to find the root word of this to find it. And the word means crave. That's what it means. Has anybody in here ever craved anything? Isn't there something different when you crave something? You'll, you'll go out of your way. Has there any, been any women who craved or were pregnant? 
Any pregnant women ever? You were once? I mean, I only know that because my wife was pregnant twice, and she would crave things at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, I, you know, we've craved whether it be sweet or just something. Or, or, and, and they even go to the extent of somebody on drugs. They're not trying to say that. They're just saying that's how powerful this is, this word they're talking about. It's a craving, an addiction. God, I have it too. Have you, or, now let me re-ask you, are you craving God? Every one of you, the real you, your spirit is craving God, wants to crave God. Are y'all with me? So what's being fed more? Because it's dominating the other two. I had a list but he wanted me to get my priority and my purpose first. First. He said, are you seeking me like you seek championships in baseball? We had just won our 10th one. I said, that's not fair. I spend a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And all of a sudden, I caught myself giving excuses. And so... I said, okay, you challenged the wrong guy. I'm doing it. And I did it. My flesh hated it. Why? Because my flesh was being fed more than my spirit was. Are y'all with me or not? I just want you to stay with me on this. And things would get me angry. Because why? My spirit wasn't fed as much as my flesh was or my mind was. God said, no, just seek me. You want to know the answer to everything? You've got any kind of question to God? I can tell you the answer, seek God. Crave him as your soul's first necessity. Well, that's not going to fall on you like a ripe cherry off of a tree, right? So I started taking my notes and tapes and Brother Hagen and Mark Hankins and anybody I get a hold of, and I'm just doing it. Week goes by, two weeks go by. Candy goes, how's the craving going? I went, ah, I hated it. I'm just being honest. What hated it? I was having a cleansing. But what was happening was word and life and truth were getting in my spirit. And my spirit was growing. But I couldn't sense it yet. And my flesh was hating it. But something was happening. A change started happening. And I turned into the real person that I am today. I never would sing, sing. I never would. Are you kidding me? But all of a sudden, things changed. I didn't want to be up in front talking to, to people. Nothing like that. <clears throat> but something changed. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call from my boss, my athletic director. He said, Chip, I need you to come at this time. But that's the time I gave God. I gave God a time. He said, Chip, are you seeking me? I gave him a time, and I made a commitment that nobody is going to take that time. I'm going to fight for it. And, and so now I'm fighting for it with my boss, and I love my boss. He said, Chip, i got to have you at that time. I said, boss, I can't do it. Chip, listen, you have to do it. It's the only time I have, and, and the board of directors and blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> no, no. I'm sitting there thinking, I made a promise to God. No. I said, I can't. And then these words, he wouldn't budge. He was hard-headed. And then these words came out of my, listen, these words came out of my spirit. Not my soul or me. And my spirit said, then I'm just going to have to resign my job. No. I could, my ears couldn't believe. What my spirit said. Are y'all with me? How did that happen? Because I began to put the word in me. And I began to fellowship and pray and rejoice and spend time in fellowship with my father. I began to do what the Bible says, seek me and all these things shall be added. That's his part of it. Amen? And I didn't know what seeking was. I thought it was going to church. Every Sunday, throwing a couple Wednesdays.
Don't show me where the Christians are. I don't want to see your hands. I want to see the seekers of God. Because God's got people, and those seekers know how to keep their composure because they know their priorities and their purpose. And their priorities are what? Seek ye first and his ways of doing things. What does the Bible say about it? What's the good news say about it? Not what I'm hearing now. I'm not focusing on the negative news now. I'm focusing on the good news. I'm keeping my composure, and I'm not letting the devil in. Amen? Woo! This is how champions. Don't get that victim mentality. That's from the devil, and it'll get hold of you. It will, but you can let it go. You can repent. You can change. Amen. And so I said that, and he goes, are you kidding me? You're going re- to you're gonna, you're gonna resign. <sighs> Looked in a mirror. And uh, I said, with a peace. Yeah. I'll resign. I love you. I told him. I love the program, I love everything, but I think so. I think I'm going to resign. So do I need to come in and sign anything or whatever, the contract and all that? He said, no, we'll change the time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was my flesh. <laughs> and... When I hung up the phone, God, thank you. I, I don't have in my notes to tell about my testimony. This is God for somebody. And I hung up the phone. And the Lord said, now you're seeking me. Now you're seeking me. And I said, what? This is in my office. He said, for the first time in your life, now, and you're Billy Brim's boy, When you're born, you're born again. (laughs) You, eh, that's in tongues right there. (laughs) No, I ain't telling you that I hadn't backslid and blah, 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 but I'm just telling you I grew up in the faith house. And so he said, for the first time in your life, You begged another person not to take your time, my time, away from you. He said, that's why I created, man. I couldn't walk. I couldn't wait to walk in the garden with Adam. I couldn't wait to partner with him, to fellowship with him. He wants to talk to you more than you want him to talk to you. That's hard for you to believe, but it's true. He wants to fellowship with you. He craves you more. He craves you. He created you to do that. He's got so much to reveal. Are y'all with me? I like to call it, ta-da. Whoa. I want more, ta-da, in my life. I proclaim that this... From here on out will be the year of ta-da, the year of what? Revelation. I speak it into existence. I believe it, and I'm keeping the devil out of part of it. He will not have place in my home. And if I feel that anger come, and it will, right? It will. I'm not nursing it. Are you with me? Will you all agree with that? And that eliminate that devil from getting in. And so he said, now's the, and he goes, now's the time. And I go, I knew what he meant. He didn't have to say it was time for the ministry. I said, Lord, how can I preach? All I know how to do is coach. And I do it really intently. I can't imagine going to Alma, Arkansas. Come on! He said, did I not help you train champions in baseball for 14 years? I said, yeah, Lord, I gave you all the glory. 
He said, then I will help you train champions for me because I'm coming back for a champion church. He's not coming back for a weak, second place, kiss your sister church. He's coming back for a strong, mighty warrior. Now watch this. Compose. We used to look at our players on. I, sometimes I liked it when we got behind late because I just wanted to see in their eyes. I just wanted to see in their eyes who's got fear and who's like, give me the bat, get me in, whatever. Remember one time we are playing Louisiana State on ESPN. We called timeout, got out of the dugout, and I said, Coach, I've got him. So I said, Coach DeBrian, so I got him. Boom, we're out there. And I don't say a word. I just look. And I'm just looking at eyes. I'm looking at eyes. Fox Stadium, LSU, man, they're throwing Everything, then crawfish, everything at you. Anything they can get their hands on. They're mean down there. And all I'm doing is just looking at them, bro. And I could see the ones doing this but didn't really want to do it. They got with me? Shaking their heads. That's what I'm supposed to do. This is the answer you want. Are y'all with me? But you can see. And then you can see the ones that are just like, you get on my agenda. Hey, boom, this is the time. I know ESPN, boom, we'll be on the highlight show. You can see them. Hurry up, coach, with your speech. Hurry up. We gotta. You can see them. I said, I've just seen everything I need to see. Who is it? Where are you? Where are you at in this game? God created us to live in this time. Young kids, if you can get a hold of this composure thing, you can get a hold of this anger thing at a young age. My God, you're going to live a better life. You're going to live an awesome life. You get a hold of this seek God. And he said, name it champions for Christ. He said, put the four in there. Don't put F-O-R. Put the four because it means the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and you. What was that? What was that he just showed me? ta -da! It was a revelation of the number four, the Trinity plus one. Hmm. You can look it up, and that's what it means. But I learned it from him. I like that. It's cool to get it from a book. But, man, when God tells you. And guess what happened when I went out of there that day? My countenance changed. My demeanor changed. My, my personality changed. Well, it changed to what? The real me. Does that make sense? And everybody's going, you're not the same. Umpires are going, he's not the same. And people who just knew me, I was still wanting to win and all that, but I wasn't the same. The real me. And I remember one time, I'll just close this up right now. But I remember one time I was preaching in California, Sacramento, big church. Pastor Zaray McGrath. And I love him, and, and he loves me, and we still do. And I preached this message, and I preached about passion, and that's what's going to happen to you when you seek God, the real you. And those things aren't going to get you to anger and wrath, because your priorities is, are straight. Your purpose is right. It's bigger than your pressure and your pride. And I talked about passion. And he said, Chip, I don't believe that. And I said, well, okay. And uh, he said, I don't believe everybody's going to be a Jesse or, or act like you or Jesse or Billy Brim. Woo! And I said, I'm not trying to talk about how you act. But he goes, my personality. Now listen, here we go. But my personality, you know what you just said? Flesh. My flesh. Flash, 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 flash. Oh, you You understand what I'm talking about? And the Lord said something out of me that wasn't me because it was too cool. It was too good. I'd love to accept this, but I can't. And he said, don't let your personality affect your passion. 
Let your passion affect your personality. How's that going to happen? Seek God. Seek Him. Seek Him and His ways. And you know what one of His ways are, guys? Be angry. Sin not. Because if it turns into wrath, then that is of the devil, and that gives Him pain. So we're in a time right now where it's easily to get angry. How are we going to respond? Amen? And you may not think, well, but people are watching. And they're people who are very important to God and his plan. And they're watching you. There's not a person in here they're not watching. How are you responding? Champions! are composed. Gideon, you mighty man of God. An angel of the Lord came down to Gideon. Gideon's like, what? You got the wrong dude. I've never been in a weight room in my life. Look at my neck. It's pencil size. I got number two tattooed on here last week just because of that. See, y'all don't, that's Chip Brim's translation. Y'all don't have my Bible. Okay. But Gideon gives him five excuses of why, and this hadn't happened, and what you told our forefathers, and I come from the tribe of this and that. Are y'all with me? But he called him what? You mighty man. You know what that word means in Hebrew? Champion. He comes down and sees Gideon, who he is, really. You're a champion. God sees you as, as a champion. You are a champion in his eyes. He does otherwise he failed because he created you in his image. You may have failed. You may have lived this life of anger and held on to it. It's gotten a hold of you. But you get the power to repent. You can repent and get right back on track. As if nothing happened. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Right where you need to be. And being used as God's people. Well, it happened right here. And I'm so thankful that your pastor asked me to speak here. And he said, Chip, you got to get there. And we got here. And you were led by God to, to give that verse. I've got people. And so, Mom and I talked about it on her show. And. I said, Lord, who are these people? And he said, champions. They're champions. And champions are composed. And I need you composed in them. Amen? Let's all stand up. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. You've been sitting. Anybody get anything tonight? Are you sure? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. How about this one? He is a rewarder of those. God is a rewarding God. He's not a punishing God. He is a rewarding God. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently, what seek mean? He rewards those who diligently just go to church. No, all of the list that we gave you, there's nothing wrong with the list, but that follows your heart. You'll want to do the list. You'll want to do more for the list. Amen? God seekers. Where are the seekers? Where are the composed? Where are the ones who can hear me? Because when you're composed, you, you're in a better position to hear from than you were under pressure. Don't let pressure and problems get bigger than your priorities, bigger than your purpose. Jesus was the greatest example. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you that it will not go void. I plead the blood over every word that was spoken today and tonight. And Lord, if it even was for just one person, if it was for one person, I want to thank you for that. Because I know it's for me. And I know it helps me. 
And the Holy Spirit, you've helped me and you've guided me and you lead me. And I am sensitive to you. I'm more sensitive to you than I have ever been in my life. And Lord, I'm a seeker of God. And so if there's anybody right now that needs to repent, just lift your hands and repent. Say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me for any doubt, for any unbelief, for not seeking, for not letting loose everything. What does that scripture help me? Um, he that loses his, uh, Nate, help me with that. He that loses his life, is that it? Shall find it. But he, that, does anybody know exactly what scripture that is? But he that, what? No, 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 You're, we're close. Does anybody know where it's at? Matthew what? Matthew 10, 39, can you throw it up real quick? I, they're good, you're crack staff here. First team, All-American staff. All right. All right. Give me uh, King James, please. I heard my mom's voice there. It sounds really close to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he that findeth his life. Your life. That means your preconceived ideas, your ways of doing it. You're going to lose it. But he that loseth, that means surrender and that means release. Releases and surrenders your ways of doing things. Your thoughts, your preconceived ideas or dreams. His life for my sake shall what? That word find there, and I want you to do this. Look it up for yourself. Is the word, Greek word, eurisko. And it's where we get the word eureka. Eureka! And it means to discover. And the Lord told me, he said, you're not to decide your plan. You're not to decide your life. Look, young people, everybody look at me. You're not to decide it. You're to discover God's plan in your life. You're to discover it. Eureka! No wonder John G. Lake said, an adventure in God. Just around the corner. Well, you can't do that if you're always complaining and nursing anger. Are y'all with me? There's no Eureka. But we should be living a life of Eureka. That's what we were called and planned and designed to do. Amen? To discover. Discover. He's got so much more for you to discover. And it's awesome. Amen? Thank you for coming on a Sunday night. You didn't have to, but you did. Thank you so much. Thank you for sitting there and not leaving because I got a little bit loud sometimes. Got on you. Looked like I was going to make you do push-ups or laps. It get, I, I, I've asked God, Lord, when can I, when are you going to allow me where I get to do that? Because that's been one of my prayers. <laughs> that's the flesh. Not the spirit. Amen. I love this church. It's like family. I love you guys. Thank you for letting me in part. Pastor Kamar. Awesome. So thankful. So thankful for the gift. So thankful for that word. Uh, let our purpose be greater. Just let's let our purpose be greater. Amen. Just, just lift your hands tonight for the Lord as we go tonight. Father, thank you for your purpose being made clear. We just receive it. Even those that were making decisions. Father, thank you for your purpose being made so clear. And thank you that we are your children and we know your voice. And the strangers we don't follow. We thank you for it. You know, you can ask the Lord just for great sleep, visitations from Him. Speak to me tonight. 
something that we need to be doing a little bit more. We're listening to a lot of things. When you go to bed, he says he gives his beloved sleep. Anyway, I don't know why I'm on that, but I um, just felt like maybe you should ask him for that. Get some sleep. Get some precious rest and him, his, him speaking to you. I found that lately it seems like the Lord's been doing a lot of speaking in the evenings when I'm not, when I'm not, not awake, but just quiet. Anyway, God bless you guys tonight. We'll see you. I guess we don't have night of prayer tomorrow, right? Because I'm trying to figure out when we are. No, it's just Wednesday night. So Wednesday night. And uh, we love you all. And we'll see you Wednesday night.